Hello, and welcome to another Snow Lecture for Advanced Rhetoric, the Art of Argument. And today we're going to be looking at some of the great debates in American history, their arguments, their rhetoric, and their implications. Looking around today, you'd think that we have never been more divided. There are different uh, arguments about the role of the government. There are arguments about abortion, about health care, even getting vaccinated. But looking into the past, there were a number of arguments that truly, absolutely divided this nation. And we are going to look at one of them, and that is the issue of slavery. Slavery, perhaps the most divisive issue in American history. It literally divided the country. It sent us to war. And it created repercussions that we are still dealing with today. So here's a little pop quiz. Take a look at this picture. It's obviously a 19th century brawl. Any guesses where it took place? Well, if you think things are heated now in Congress, think of what happened in 1856 uh, when uh, Preston Brooks, who was a representative from the South, attacked uh, Massachusetts Senator Charles Sumner on the floor of the Senate. Sumner had given a very fiery anti-slavery speech, and uh, Brooks felt that the honor of his region had been maligned, so he physically attacked uh, Sumner with a cane, beat him very badly. Sumner was actually very seriously injured and took him a while to get back. Preston, uh, Preston Books resigned. However, um, he later sought uh, political office in other capacities. And afterwards, many supporters of hearing about this sent him canes as a measure of support. So this is just an example of how divisive uh, the, uh, the issue of slavery became in the 19th century. Now, obviously, the fight that occurred on the floor of the Senate was soon extended to the entire country, and we won't go into the history of the Civil War. But that, for all intents and purposes, solved the issue of slavery. But many believe that the cultural issues that were, um, that were uh, involved in the American Civil War are still going on, and we will take a look at some of them. So we're going to look back at the slavery issue, and we're going to look at the arguments, the debates. And we are actually going to pay a little closer attention to the pro-slavery sl slavery arguments. And why is that? Well, to quote the um, editor of a book, Slavery Defended, this is why. Because nothing is more susceptible to oblivion than an argument, however ingenious, that has been discredited by events, and such is the case with a body of writing which was produced in the antebellum South in defense of Negro slavery. And what he means is we don't look at this issue very much, and we don't look at the slaver's point of view. And I think um, by doing that, we can really get a sense of what was actually um, being argued and what was being debated back in those days. I'm using as my source material two books that I fortunately was able to get out of the Regis Library. One is something called Slavery Attacked, and it looks at original documents in the abolitionist crusade. We also have in the library Slavery Defended, which actually has, again, original documents from slave owners, slave proponents, um, congressmen, other political leaders that show that the argument for slavery didn't boil down to a few nasty slaveholders in the South, that, but it was a very vigorously defended, argued, and intellectualized. And I think that's something that we should keep in mind today. You notice the condition of the books. One, the slavery attacked is very well used. The other one, slavery defended, is hardly looked at today. So I think that's something that would behoove us to look at these arguments and really uh, understand where people are coming from so that we can better address the issues and, and uh, extrapolate that material to what is happening today. So we've seen the movies about the evil slaveholders, but the slavery supporters had rational arguments, or what they considered rational arguments for, for holding slaves. And they broke down to a very variety of areas, including economics, in other words, in the South, uh, slavery was needed to uh, run cotton, which benefited the whole country. And the cotton is king 
argument was often used. They cited Aristotle and Aristotle's vision of an ordered society, which required this kind of forced labor. They also argued vociferously that slaves were better off than wage earners. They were fed, they were clothed, uh, they, didn't, they didn't have to worry about um, uh, where they were going to get their next job. Religion, of course, used by many sides, that, that the Bible supports slavery, that that is in the Bible, therefore it is supported. It also went into custom. It's always been this way. There have been slaves since the time of the Romans and Greeks, so we just have to continue. And then the, the peculiar, peculiarly American version of this was that whites were racially superior to um, blacks. And we call this racism today, but at the time, this was a very commonly accepted idea, even among those who wish to free the slaves. Now, abolitionists, those who oppose slavery, based their arguments on pretty similar areas that, uh, as the slaveholders. For example, religion. They said they say Christianity is simply not compatible with, with slavery, and they argued using the Bible as well. Economics. They felt that wage earners were more productive than slaves in terms of holding up the economy. Many people raised the specter of a slave-holding state conspiracy. Many felt that slave-holding states were trying to take over the country, and so therefore they had to be stopped. And others cited basic human rights. Rights, life, liberty, and this pursuit of happiness should be extended to those of African descent as well as those of European descent. But I have to stress, and I think this has come out, many abolitionists still believe the whites were a superior race to those from Africa and other countries. Let's look at some of these arguments. I'm going to quote here from John Calhoun, again, a former vice president, a secretary of state, a very prominent uh, player in American history. And he writes that um, basically slaves, the Africans' lives were improved by coming as slaves to this continent. Never before has a black race of Central Africa, from the dawn of history to the present day, attained a condition so civilized and so improved, not only physically, but morally and intellectually. The um, others cited the economics argument, as we mentioned, and uh, in fact, one person argued that had there no been, not been slaves in Egypt and Hindustan, meeting in India and other places, there had, would not be the great works of the pyramids and other monuments that were built by slave labor. It's interesting because uh, at once I did a story on a PBS special which looked at the issue of slave labor and the pyramids, and the particular people involved concluded it could not have been done by slaves because it was too intricate, it needed too much work, it needed too much commitment. So it's interesting that this argument was being drawn out. There's other arguments. One was that it just would cost too much to end slavery. It would drag down the economy. And uh, Professor Dew at uh, uh, William & Mary tried to calculate the cost, and he was looking at the situation in Virginia. He basically said, um, if you had, if you estimated the cost for every slave to be two hundred dollars to buy him back, would be a hundred million, and the houses and the lands in the state only came to two hundred six million, so it just isn't possible. And I put a little box here, and you'll see these little boxes throughout this lecture to think for things to think about. Think about this issue of cost. How often is this brought up in today's society? We would do that, but it would cost too much. We could help that person. We could do this project, but it would cost too much. Um, think of the rhetoric that's from the um, many people say the government can't afford things. Why should we subsidize agricultural? Why should we go try to go out into space? So this is an argument that often comes up and is used over and over again in various American arguments. I think this is a very um, interesting argument that we, we often um, don't, we tend to overlook. And it's not just that um, slave owners argued that slaves were better off, they were well taken care of. They just said as an economic model, this kind of feudalism was better than the harsh capitalism that they were seeing emerging. They looked at the Irish. Uh, who were dying, starting to die amid um, the first of uh, several uh, uh, potato famine, uh, potato failures of the potato crop. Um, and they looked at this and they basically had said that slaves 
beca were because they got housing and food and other amenities were better off than wage earners who just got a little bit of money. And at the time, wage earners were indeed very um, not very well off. Um, there were even poems written for it, and here I've, I've there are a couple section of poems that I that I brought in. These were used as a kind of a, a, a rhetorical flourish to um, support this area. For example, let me read this: the streams of wealth that foster pomp and pride, no food nor shelter for his wants provide. This is talking about the wage earner. He fails to win by toil intensely hard the bare sustenance, labor's least reward. They also bring up the fact that, if in this poem, brings up, well, if you free people, they'll just be lazy. For example, the Negro freedman, thrifty while a slave, loosened from restraint, becomes a drone or knave, each effort to improve his nature foils, begs, steals, or sleeps, and starves, but never toils. Let me read the last, last um, section here. Secure they toil, uncurse their peaceful life, with labor's hungry broils and wasteful strife, no want to go, no faction to deplore, the slave escapes the perils of the poor. Do any of these arguments resonate today? Do they seem familiar in other forms? We'll take another look at that in a minute. The issue that um, slaves were better off uh, in uh, the United States and in Africa is something that um, I think many people would find not only distasteful, but entirely horrible. Um, this was a very valid position, however, in the period leading up to the Civil War. Now, what about today? It seems to be being revived. For example, here is a section from Pat Buchanan's 2008 essay. Here's what he says. America has been the best country on earth for black folk. It was here that 600,000 black people brought from Africa in slave ships grew to a community of 40 million, were introduced to Christian salvation, and reached the greatest levels of freedom and prosperity blacks have ever known. That's his opinion. Um, it might be debated, but it certainly is something that many, many people, um, primarily white people, in this country have come to believe. Take a look at this uh, 2011 political platform. There's the idea that um, African-American families in slavery were more intact than they were uh, than they are today. Um, this one, I think, is more patently false given the instances of slave families being broken up. However, this is a, a, a point that has been repeated, that is increasingly being repeated, and we'll see it again in this next coming election. Now let's look at that argument about wage earners versus wage or slaves, as you will. Think about that. Um, Consider the, the debate over the minimum wage. Here are some um, facts that I brought up, or some points, I should say, from the Cato Institute, which basically says that if you give people higher wages, it's not going to help them. And they have their reasons, and I think if you go to the website, you will find where they back it up. But they're basically saying if you give them more money, it's not going to bring them out of poverty. Um, they will lose jobs. There will be higher prices. Uh, this is one of the issues that they bring up. Now let's take a look at the uh, abolitionist arguments. Again, I'm, we're not dwelling on those. I think this is something that you probably got in many of your history classes. But a thing I want to stress is that even within the anti-slavery or abolitionist movement, there were many factions, and they took different positions. Some wanted to political reform. Some wished to persuade uh, slave owners to give, give up their slaves by moral argument or appeals to their motion and to their reason. Some wish to free slaves and bring them, take them back to Africa. And, but many people tried to show that slavery was not benign because they felt this was a very potent argument. In 1839, Theodore Weld, his wife Angela, her sister Sarah Grimke, she was part of the Grimke sisters who were quite uh, prominent, they started researching this issue, trying to use logic and emotion to uh, reach people's hearts. And so they went through the newspapers and they found evidence of whippings and cruelty uh, to slaves. And these were just little bits and pieces that were, ordin were ordinary um, uh, notices in the newspaper. So the idea was this was unbiased information. And um, if you look at them, they're, they're pretty awful. They talk about women that, they, uh, for example, um, 
committed to jail as a runaway, a Negro woman named Martha, 17 or 18 years of age, has numerous scars of the whip on her back. And they talk about how they can identify these people by their scarring. This does two things. One, it shows the cruelty of living in slaves and also shows that these people were not necessarily happy. If they were whisking, risking the whip, they were not happy in their lot. This is a common tactic. Um, and there are many, many applications of this kind of research and appeals to both emotion and logic. And I've just pulled out one of them, which is, for example, PETA or other groups that they go into slaughterhouses or they go into labs, they take pictures, and they bring out evidence. And the idea is that the average person seeing that will be moved by it. Even if you're not, uh, even if you're not a vegetarian, you, you don't necessarily want to see the suffering of animals. And I think this is the same logic that these researcher doing say you may you may have some uh, negative feelings about uh, Africans as inferior but look at the suffering that they are undergoing or you might say they the southerners talk about how benign slavery is but look at this evidence that suggests it is not this case so now we're going to drill down on William Lloyd Garrison and I pick him because he is from Massachusetts um, and he is a, probably very well known, but again, like many things, I think his image has been a little bit sanitized over the year. He represented a radical ring of abolitionists. He said there was no working with southern states. He, in fact, was in favor of the South seceding or splitting up the Union. He was not in favor of keeping the parts together, which was the point of the Civil War. He believed there should be no truck, no compromise with slave owners. Absolutely none. Let's take a look at some of the rhetoric that uh, Garrison used. He was the editor of a very influential abolitionist newspaper called The Liberator. Um, it came out, originally came out in 1831, and here is the language that he used in the first issue. I am aware that many object to the severity of my language, but there is not. But is there not cause for severity? I will be as harsh as truth and as, comp as uncompromising as justice. On the subject, I do not wish to think or speak or write with moderation. No, no, tell a man whose house is on fire to give a moderate alarm. Tell him to moderately rescue his wife from the hands of the ravisher. Tell the mother to gradually extricate her babe from the fire into which it has fallen. But urge me not to use moderation in a cause like the present. Now, today, I think it's easy for us to say, you know, applaud him, say right on. Obviously, slave was a horrible moral evil. But it's interesting, at the time, maybe other abolitionists believed that Garrison was unnecessarily antagonizing potential supporters, and that he was, he was turning off people as much as uh, firing up the masses. So these are issues that I think come into play today. What do you think? What do you think about using extreme language uh, on a point where you believe in it very strongly? Certainly, you might employ it when it's a cause you believe in, but what if it's the other side of the debate. What about then? Another thing I want to stress in this lecture is that um, oftentimes we dwell on the actions of the white and the male abolitionists, but there are many, many uh, people of color who were involved in this. The most prominent was Frederick Douglass. Douglass was a, a kind of a protege, if you will, of Gar Garrison, but he went on to be an activist on his own. Um, he, in fact, broke with Garrison. He was actually more moderate with Garrison. He felt there could be compromise, could be political reform with the South. Uh, but he was, he was very active, and we could spend a whole section on the work of Frederick Douglass. The other um, aspect I want to stress is that there are many, many women abolitionists, not just Harry Beecher Stowe, who wrote Uncle Tom's Cabin, but many others who were very, very active in this particular in this particular political value uh, 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 battle, and I think um, people uh, may not hear as much about them today. And just to emphasize that um, the split on slavery was not north-south to start with, although it became that way, I've referred to an incident in 1835 when Garrison was attacked and lynched in, wait for it, Boston. There was a meeting of the Boston Female Anti-Slavery Society. 
um, Garrison was attending. There was uh, a mob that uh, gathered outside. Um, he attempted to escape. The mob caught him, put a rope around his waist, was dragging him to the, through the streets, um, and he was rescued by um, some strangers, and he was later put in jail for his own protection. This happened in Boston. You can kind of see where things happened. This was right here, if you can see where I'm circling. Uh, that was where the meeting of the uh, the uh, um, Anti-Slavery Society was held. And um, the city, old city hall was over here. If you can see that, that in the, actually right here is approximately the site of the Boston Massacre, if I'm remembering my geography well. Um, okay. Um, one thing that I find interesting in terms of his history in Boston is you can walk. This is Downtown Crossing right here. Um, and you can kind of walk these streets. They've changed a little bit, but you can still sort of see the um, area in which this uh, riot took place, this mob attack on Garrison. Um, I, to be honest, in my own historical research, I often go to the sites where things have happened and just walk around. Um, sometimes this, the area has changed a lot, but sometimes it hasn't, and you can just get a feel for what happened here. And so this was a major event. It was almost a lynching, almost a lynching, right here in Boston. One of the things I'd like to get to do is give you a sense of the sample arguments that were used in Garrison Times. And in a really interesting book that I found in the uh, library at Regis College, I found a description of an argument that he had with a slave old, old owner while Garrison actually was in jail in Baltimore, Maryland. It was one of his uh, conscious objector type, type of activities. And I think the interchange between him and the slave owner is very revealing. Uh, what I'm going to have to do, however, it, I, it is difficult for me to embed it in this particular lecture, but I will put it up on uh, YouTube and it'll be connected. You will be able to um, access it through Moodle. So I hope you'll take the time to look at that um, argument um, and we'll probably discuss it in class. I'd be curious, very curious to know what you think about it. So this concludes our look at the slavery issue and some of the arguments and rhetoric that was used. We will do one more historical um, examination, and this will be of the prohibition, uh, the lead up to prohibition and the aftermath of the, the years that the United States went dry. We'll look at some of the threads that extended from the slavery debate, and we will look at how the debate over prohibition has resonance today, particularly with the marijuana debate. Um, so I look forward to seeing you on Wednesday, in which we'll talk about um, the uh, effects of banning alcohol in the United States.